so xylosine is a non-opioid sedative. Um, it's not approved for use in humans, according to the Food and Drug Administration. There have been some studies that have looked at the effects of xylosine in humans, um, and those have suggested that um, when humans are exposed to xylosine, it can actually act as a central nervous system depressant and can cause things like hypotension and respiratory depression. Because it's not an opioid, it doesn't respond to opioid reversal agents such as naloxone. Um, however, we always recommend that it always naloxone be administered in the event that xylosine is exposure is suspected because we often find it in IMF products. Nationally, the drug supply information that we have um, shows that despite no human consumption, xylosine is increasingly found in it um, across the U.S. It has long been seen in Puerto Rico um, and our Philadelphia colleagues and uh, have really been experiencing um, xylosine's presence for some time with over 90% of heroin samples also containing xylosine. And so this first map looks specifically at xylosine detection in fentanyl involved overdoses and the darker colors um, correspond to a higher number of deaths. So you tend to see here concentration in the eastern part of the United States, uh, particularly the northeastern part of the United States, where we saw higher xylosine detection in um, fentanyl-involved overdoses. So the first one is wounds. Um, this has been the primary focus of media coverage to date and it's been the main thing discussed um, with xylosine exposure. And I just wanna note that our understanding of xylosine wounds is underway. Um, we're learning more every day about their progression, about their cause, and about uh, best practices for wound treatment. So we're making um, a lot of headway. At the same time, there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, so this first quote is from a person who uses opioids, and he said, it's not meant for human consumption. I mean, it says right on the bottle and there's no way to prevent it. I've got wounds in places I don't even get high in. So this person perhaps was injecting in his arm, but he had a wound on his leg. People get wounds in places where they're not injecting. The reason for that is currently unknown. An academic researcher said, and with some wounds, people continue to inject in that spot because it's a spot that they know they can fit and stay well. So some of the various interventions that I've seen are hand washing stations on the street or in harm reduction organizations having access to showers 24 hours a day and not just at night if you're in a shelter or something like that. Next, I wanna talk about xylosine withdrawal. Uh, it's currently poorly understood, but it is marked by extreme physical discomfort and anxiety. Uh, withdrawal is a barrier to accessing treatment for substance use disorder or medical care. Um, and I will say that I talk to people frequently who have really severe xylosine wounds, but they say that the wounds really pale in comparison to the discomfort of withdrawal. Um, one person said it's like one of the worst detoxes right now because the rehabs can't seem to find something to help with the withdrawal and the tranquilizer is the worst habit to kick because apparently it takes two to four weeks to get off of it. So these are people who are attempting to access treatment for opioid use disorder, but the withdrawal is so agonizing that they eventually leave to use again. One thing that I think is very under discussed currently is risks related to xylosine sedation. So there are kind of three risks that I'm talking about here. The first is concerns about the risk of limb injury from immobility that can span hours. So if somebody's heavily sedated and unconscious and maybe their arm is pinned under their body, risks of the loss of blood flow to that limb. But the two that I'm gonna talk about are physical injury due to conscious sedation, which would be, you know, they're walking around but they're not really conscious of what's going on and afterwards they don't really remember what happened. Um, and then safety, so losing personal possessions and being at risk for physical and sexual assault. So some of the earliest uh, state uh, public health efforts that we saw are focused heavily on raising awareness in communities about the presence of xylosine and the risks associated with its use. These efforts really seek to educate the public, including people who use drugs, about harm reduction resources, uh, the continued importance of uh, naloxone uh, when someone is experiencing an overdose, and where to find services like wound care. The second uh, area in which we've seen uh, state response activities is in testing. Xylosine is generally not a part of routine toxicology testing, which can make it challenging for states to know the true scope of the issue and how uh, different communities in their state may be affected. Uh, some states like uh, Connecticut have worked with hospitals to test those who experience a non-fatal overdose for xylosine 
Uh, and those partnerships with hospitals and labs are really important so that overdose prevention efforts can be really data informed uh, and data driven and states can uh, understand uh, what they're what they're seeing in their supply, uh, including xylosine. Some states are also advancing the use of xylosine test strips. Those can be used to test drug samples to determine whether they contain xylosine. These test strips are similar to fentanyl test strips, which have been around a little bit longer, so you may uh, be more familiar with them. Uh, these test strips allow people who use drugs to make informed decisions about um, whether and how much uh, of a substance they want to consume. And then point of care drug checking sites have a similar goal, uh, and these are locations where people who use drugs can have their supply checked for the presence of xylosine or fentanyl. Um, some localities have made fentanyl test strips available to people who are leaving jail or other carceral settings. As xylosine test strips are more newly available, we may uh, begin to see those uh, utilized more broadly as well. And finally, states are continuing to emphasize access to compassionate care for people who use drugs by making sure that they have access to low barrier harm reduction services uh, and wound care uh, and continuing to facilitate referrals for medical care uh, treatment, whatever additional services that may be needed, including uh, mental health services.